Do you know what the most recent science says about how you should train or how you could train better? No? Well then, stick with us because that is the aim of this Elevate podcast. Each week we will take a scientific paper or a scientific area of research, we will look at the findings and then we will apply them to you in a real world way so that hopefully you can develop towards your goals and enjoy your sport more. And I say we because it's not just me. I'll be presenting these podcasts with uh, my good friend Scott Finley. We have coached and trained together within triathlon and multi-sport and competed together for years. And Scott has an academic background, is currently studying a PhD, but is also a real world coach working one-to-one with athletes and within a club environment. So hopefully we have the experience on the academic side to marry that with how that's applied to you in the real world. So if that sounds of interest, we're gonna keep these podcasts short and sweet. We'll take 20 to 30 minutes of your time and hopefully it'll be really beneficial for you and you can enjoy these podcasts. Okay, so hi everyone. Welcome back to the Elevate podcast. Um, This is Joel and I'm Scott and we're going to be talking to you today about another study, another um, scientific paper looking at triathletes. So the the title of this one was Physiological Features of Olympic Distance Amateur Triathletes as well as their associations with performance in women and men, a cross-sectional study. It's a bit of a mouthful but Basically, this study is looking at the physiological and anthropometric determinants of triathlon performance in amateur Olympic distance triathletes. Right, Scott, um, that's a lot of words for this time in the morning. Can, can, put it, can you put that in absolute layman's terms so that I don't get dazed and confused before the conversation starts? Yes, absolutely. So, Thank you. The researchers here were just trying to figure out what performance characteristics, so you know whether whether they were, um, how fit they were, um, but also things about their body composition. So, um, you know, that might be body fat, it could be, um, you know, height and weight, things like that. So looking to see how those things impact their triathlon performance. Nice, okay, good stuff. Okay, Thank you. Uh, moving on to some quick fire questions to start us off. Um, so does your natural body type mean you can't be successful at triathlon? Natural body, I've got to unpack that question. Natural body type can't be successful at triathlon. No, I think it's the correct answer. (laughs) Thank you. Are most amateur athletes at the limit of what they're capable of physiologically? No, they're not. And last one, does improving body body composition always just mean losing fat? Absolutely not. Thank you very much. It's a good question, Scott. I, I, I like that. It's enjoyable. Yeah. Thank you. And I'm not trying to trip you up. No, it's fine. <laughs> so quick uh, run through of the study. So what was the study about? We had 20 males, 20 female triathletes um, put through a series of tests to try and see what things were associated with their performance. So they'd all performed, uh, all competed in this recent Olympic distance triathlon. Um, and they, they measured these these things and compared them to the performance to see whether they they were related or or correlated. Um, So they used running economy measurement, um, so that was done over four minutes, and they did a VO2 max test. Um, So just briefly, can you explain what each of these tests is? Uh, Yes, so uh, running economy is uh, how efficiently you use oxygen at a given running speed. So it doesn't have to be particularly fast. In this study, it was eight kilometers an hour. So really, really slow, but they're just measuring how efficiently you utilize oxygen at that speed. Uh, And VO2 is, uh, or VO2 max, did you say VO2 or VO2 max? VO2 max max is the maximum uh, rate at which you can utilize oxygen. Um, uh, Yes. maximum rate and, and a, that's your ceiling if you like and you just you can't go beyond that physiological parameter yeah absolutely so and uh, as you mentioned as well vo2 obviously just being the current level of of oxygen that you are that you are using so throughout that vo2 max test mm-hmm. you know your your levels are going to be rising and rising and that's um but until you reach that max you're not at your vo2 max 
level. Um, just quickly, if, if hopefully people listened to the podcast from last week, but um, if they remember the last, the test in the last paper was a one kilometer time trial, again, for triathletes. Um, so thinking about the tests used here, how do they compare to last week? Do you think these are maybe more appropriate? Yeah, I mean, massively more appropriate, really, um, because essentially they're looking at the measurement is of triathletes in a triathlon. So they've gone very much more specific. And again, if people go back and listen to last week's, one of the things that we said was, yes, there's some interesting information there, but actually the the kind of construction of the paper and the methodology and the design and things wasn't actually that specific. Um, whereas this feels a lot more specific and a lot more relevant and they've measured across swim, bike, run and total duration as well, um, as well as some laboratory assessments so that they get that underlying physiological data as well. Would you agree? Yes. Yeah, definitely. It's, I mean, uh, you know, even the, the, as you said, even the race alone is, is already a more um, realistic measure of their performance um, mm. or direct measure of their performance. Okay. Speaking of predictors of performance, um, let's move on to the results. So I'm just going to take you through um, the females first um, and what the paper said were the best predictors of, of their performance in this triathlon. So they started off with absolute VO2 max um, and also experience in triathlon competitions for swimming. Um, for the bike, their best predictor was VO2 max relative to body mass. For the run, the best predictor was speed at RCP. So that is the respiratory compensation point. Um, would you be able to just quickly define that one for us, Joel? I think most people would normally think of it as threshold. So the kind of the, the pace or speed that you're running where your body has accumulated as much lactate as it can deal with. And above and beyond that, it's going to be accumulating too much lactate. And that's going to mean that you basically you sort of slow down at some point in the very near future so essentially read that as threshold thank you very much um and then finally for total race time for again for females vo2 max lean mass and triathlon experience very quickly run through the men as well um i'm gonna swimming. jump in there sorry just to interrupt as well and one of the key things i think to pick up about this study is that it specifically was looking at the differences between men and women. And you might be going to ask a question about this in a bit, but I think early on in the conversation, it's really important to say that the researchers were motivated to say, well, look, loads of the research is in, is in males, as we know, like scientific data is skewed towards male population. Um, whereas this was saying, OK, so a lot of coaching methodology is based on this data that comes from men what about you know what about women is it the same is it different and if it is different in what way so i think through this conversation it's important to pick out the fact that this is new and interesting data you know relevant to female athletes and and there isn't that much out there so this is this is quite new and interesting in that sense yeah no absolutely and, that, and that's a a major problem in sports science in general uh, mm -hmm. you know a lot of sports science research is is typically done on men and then extrapolated out to women, which doesn't always um, doesn't, doesn't always match up. Mm -hmm. um, so moving on to the predictors of performance for the men, um, swimming, there was speed at RCP. So just a reminder, that's for that's basically speed at threshold. Mm -hmm. um, percentage of Android fat. Joel, can you jump in there? Uh, it is essentially the measure of fat in men's torso kind of area um so in women they were looking at i think it's gynoid fat uh, which is sort of torso it's kind of chest breast area down uh, but includes hips and thighs in men this android fat it's it's around the torso it's the tummy fat that you might typically see in some sort of more middle-aged men uh, and that that kind of area so okay grand and then that's the same for the bike so percentage of android fat with a predictor from for the bike um run it was speed at rcp or or threshold um, and then for total race time we're looking at maximal aerobic speed and percentage body fat last one to define joel um maximal aerobic speed and then would you be able to maybe chart those if you will and you know how, how does maximal aerobic speed compare to 
maybe lactate threshold or um, you know marathon pace? Yes, thank you. I think a really relevant question and one that I definitely had to think about when I was looking into this study is to because some of the terms are different and it's nice to kind of put it in, I guess, easy to understand language. So maximal aerobic speed, it's that quick answer, maximal aerobic speed is essentially your VO2 max. It's the minimum speed that you're running when you hit your maximal oxygen consumption, your VO2 max. Now, you can potentially run a little bit faster than that, but not for very much longer because your body is basically maxed out. But, you know, if you're in a sprint and it's the last 50 meters, you might be able to accelerate, but your body isn't really doing anything more. It's just that last bit of reserve and, you know, effort and, and mental energy and stuff that gets you that. Your body isn't working any better if you like to do that. So if, if we plot these on a graph, so we move from kind of walking pace on you know, bottom left, and we're moving up, 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 and getting faster, so that we're then, you know, top right is our kind of VO2 max, and our, our maximum kind of physical potential, if you like, then yeah. as we get faster, we will, first of all, the first interesting point we hit is lactate threshold one, which is the kind of typical definition of where we start to accumulate a reasonable or significant amount of lactate, but it's an amount our body can deal with. And this is happening around upper tempo maybe sweet spot on a bike it's below what we would consider threshold the body can deal with it but it's definitely the body is starting to be stressed sorry joel just for the, for the scientists Go. um what what sort of level of lactate is that what sort of measure okay so two millimoles two millimoles okay two millimoles will be the measure that that is usually that point uh then we would get and um, continue to build and we get to that res respiratory compensation point have i said have i said the right words i think yeah. i have no, no, in, right. the, <laughs> in this study and then that sort of lactate threshold too that's at a point where that accumulation of lactate because of the effort or the speed is now too much for the body to deal with and it becomes unsustainable and that's what we would generally just go off well, threshold it's like the best pace you can manage without capitulating it's the best pace you pace you can manage for an hour you know so now we're at lactate two we continue up and we get faster and then we're hitting our maximum aerobic speed or our vo2 max which are which are quite similar now maximum aerobic speed technically is a little bit lower because it's the minimal speed that you hit a vo2 max then you can go a little bit faster before you hit vo2 max and then you can do your final sprint where you go a bit faster but the body's not doing anything very much more physiologically so that that's our line and that's where we plot those points and just to draw out the ones that are significant probably for the men and women in this study is that we go through lactate one we go through threshold lactate threshold two and we build up to maximum aerobic speed this is significant for the men and then with that little bit further on the vo2 max is significant for women in this study uh scott said a lot of words did they make sense yes they do and, and i guess just for um to set the scene a little bit more so lt1 we've got two millimoles of lactate mm -hmm. um lt2 which as, as joel said there is, is kind of the traditional threshold is four millimoles of lactate and from there it it you know that you're at that point where you can't shuttle it out you can't use it quick enough so it continues to rise so you might have you know you're doing high intensity sprints or, or whatever it is you might have your lactate rising up to 18 19 20 millimoles so just as a kind of reference point there you know sprints will induce that lactate a lot quicker um and higher levels whereas the you know the relevance of the threshold is that you're able to maintain that level for a lot longer or you know that sort of hour ish time because you're able to dispose of the, the lactate quicker. Mm -hmm. Yes, and we will, um, with Elevate, we will produce our sort of more in-depth training, applied training course that will be coming out later this year. And we'll go into this whole energy systems and zones kind of science a little bit more. So for anyone who's listening, who's interested, you know, watch out for that and watch out for the opportunity to sign up, you know, for that or pre-sign up for that course. Um, what I suppose in practical terms, I would say is that, you know, if we're, and we'll probably look back to this later, but working on VO2 is they're kind of three to eight minute efforts. So when we go beyond that, 
that threshold, that four millimoles of um, blood lactate, we can still perform at a really high level. It's just we can't do it forever. So that sort of, you know, we might be able to hold that level of intensity for eight minutes. It might only be three minutes at the other end of that range. But again, that's where we're going to start to, to break down and we're not going to be able to maintain it for, for any longer than that. So in terms of reps, if you're thinking about your training and things at home and kind of an all out five minute effort is, is over threshold, you can sustain it for that long. That works on VO2, but you couldn't keep going for another hour. Just while you're on that practical question, if you're able to do, say, 10 minutes plus at your, what you think is your VO2 max zone, Mm -hmm. do you think that's time for a time for a retest uh I, yes i would say so i mean the most of the sciences i would understand it would be that kind of really for vo2 five to eight minutes if you're able to hold it for longer than that you either need a retest or yeah you you on one you could look at it from one point of view and say you need a retest you could look at it from another point of view and just go, well, actually, if you're holding the effort for that long, if you're able to hold it for that long, you're actually just working on threshold at that point. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not a hard enough intensity. Um, so I suppose you could, if you couldn't afford a retest, then you just know that if you can hold that pace that used to be your five minute pace, you can now hold it for 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. You're then not, you're not working on VO2 anymore. So you need to go back and do those three or five minute efforts at a faster pace. And that will be working on your VO2 if that's your aim for the event that you're working at or working towards right now. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it, you see a lot of people sort of saying, you know, VO2 max must be done at this percentage for this amount of time when, you know, the, the body is very, um, it, you know, it's really different to, to just that. You don't change into VO2 max as soon as you cross over that 120% mm -hmm. of, of FTP, for example. Um, you know, it's about a scale of, of levels your body's working at. So, you know, even on a given day, you might be working at VO2 max heart rate, but you're actually, your power is way below or way, way higher, just depending on, you know, fatigue and things like that. So, so yeah, something to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. yes yeah. as you said something to cover in the advanced training i think so we will loop back watch this space excuse me interrupting for 20 seconds but hopefully you're finding this conversation useful if you are please do one thing for us and that is tell a friend about the podcast and about any of the other resources on Elevate that you're finding useful. That will really help us to build the platform and produce more content that will be more relevant and more beneficial to more people. Thanks for your help. Now, back to the conversation. Okay, um, any comments on the sort of methodology or the results there? My only one was that, you know, this is it's great they've done all these these tests um the predictors of performance are obviously based on this one race mm -hmm. um obviously people have good races people have bad races um the whole point is it's it's an average of these people so it's supposed to be uh, a good correlation because it's an average of all 20 females and all 20 males but there may be outliers which might throw things off um yeah, that's just my my observation there. Uh, uh, Scott, I feel like our go-to every week when we record one of these, having looked at a study, is uh, we're, we're always just going to be able to talk about the population of yeah. of the study and and kind of say, well, you know, how can you extrapolate these results to a, to a different population? And so, you know, looking at, I, I guess, everyone in this study, right, is is able to do a triathlon, an Olympic distance, standard distance triathlon. So yeah, they they are reasonably fit. Um, but how applicable these results are to maybe uh, an age grouper or someone who's been in the sport a little bit longer. I think, you know, typically part of the inclusion criteria was that they've been in the sport for two or three years. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, mm -hmm. But, it, it, you know, it wasn't like, you know, 
10 to 15 years experience in the sport um you know we have to be careful again with how we how we extrapolate these results and and put them into a different population um so that there's you know definitely a limiting factor and and something to to think about um because really what comes out of this study i suppose for me is a couple of things one of them is that whether we describe it as you know maximum aerobic speed or vo2 which are different but are quite close the emphasis is the take home point for people listening is that it's that very very hard that high intensity work above threshold that does seem to be pretty key for both women and men and particularly for female athletes it is doing those very 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 hard reps and making sure um, as we said last week that that work gets done in training in the training phase at some point it's not what you do all the time it's not maybe what you do around your race because it might not be right for that but it does seem that aerobic ability is predicted by having a decent chunk of training time dedicated to these really high intensities so you know, I guess for people listening, it's a case of thinking, well, you know, how appropriate is that to me? And, and how can I work that into my training? And I think the next thing, the really important take home, and you touched on this at the beginning is about the body comp thing. You know, we have a tendency to look at the you know, Tour de France is coming up right, you know, pretty soon and uh, you know, have a tendency to look at those, you know, lean riders and just go, well, leaner is, is better. But actually, this study doesn't say that at all particularly again for females it says being as strong as you can is really important so particularly for the overall time and and uh, for, for cycling and potentially running as well so whereas a lot of athletes will be trying to do a lot of that middle ground kind of work tempo and threshold and trying to get really really lean actually being really really strong and doing higher intensity work might be where more benefit is based on the findings of, of this population in, in this one study yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, moving on to a few more questions. Go for um, it. So, speaking of body composition, um, this, I mean, this study is, so it's a cross-sectional study, which um, just means that they're taking a sort of snapshot of in time, so it's not, um, you know, it's only one, one measurement point. Mm -hmm. um, do you, I mean, do you think there might be a bit of a, a a chicken and eggs situation? You know, the so it's people who train more are potentially um or have more training history are potentially gonna have better body composition anyway. Um so they are naturally going to perform better. Does that make sense? Uh yes. I think it makes sense. Uh, I think I'd need to know a little bit more about this study and see more research to really get an answer for that question. And I think, unfortunately, so much of these things come down to the sort of the it depends question. I think, you know, body composition is more or less important as a consideration within training and performance depending on a whole load of other factors and i'm sure that we can all think of you know some elite endurance athletes across sports who kind of seem to defy the, the natural logic when it comes to to body composition and who are still able to produce really good performances at, at slightly less typical body compositions and and that's because that works for them so um you know, clearly there is an element of you need to be able to move your body composition efficiently, which is where the strength component comes in. Um, but I just don't think I think this de-emphasizes that kind of obsession with body composition that um, that is probably quite pre prevalent within within the sport. Um, yeah, maybe more than it should be. That's kind of half an answer. Sorry. It is, but I can follow up with with some some more information. I mean, um there's there's been the or there's a calculation that you can do or there's a um a bit of an anecdote that says oh well for every kilogram extra of body weight that you've got you will run x seconds per kilometer slower um and as you said that's that's down to the basic math or physics of it you know you have to work harder or you know or you have to you will slow down or you have to work harder to move the extra weight mm -hmm. but the important part is that we're not just talking about body fat there. We're talking about muscle. Mm. Um, you know, so we're not saying 
don't put that extra muscle on because you're going to be slower. You, you're putting that extra muscle on to be functionally more fit and, and yep. perform perform better. Yeah, and that's, yeah. that's as you said, lean body mass. And, and I, you know, I can I can speak to this really because I think that calculation roughly, you know, I, I've looked at this over five k and roughly for you know lose a kilo and I'll be three to five seconds per kilometer faster and and that all sounds really really great. So then my brain goes right, okay, so you know lose a bit of weight and it's free speed, isn't it? Apart from the fact that if I think back through you know my history, I remember running you know a flat out park run in about eighteen twenty when I was sixty four kilos and uh, you know a, a long time ago and. Uh, then I can think of when I was running at about 68 kilos and I was running kind of 17 flat. And then I can think of when I ran 1607 when I was, you know, 70, 71 kilos, you know, because I was stronger at that point. So, you know, the fastest runs I've done are not when I've been the lightest. And, that, and that's because in each of those instances, I was stronger or I'd worked on some other aspect of physiology like VO2 that actually was just you know, it was it was giving giving me more. And someone might say, ah, well, yeah, but if you worked on that and you lost weight, then you'd have been even faster. But that presupposes that I am healthier and able to tolerate that training load when I'm leaner. And so my very personal, very anecdotal feeling is that for about the last decade, if I go below about 69, 68 and a half kilos, I just can't tolerate the training, the really high intensity training. You know, I start to lose strength no matter what I'm doing in the gym. Uh, you know, the, the VO2 stuff becomes really difficult to do. My injury risk goes higher. Um, and so I might be leaner, but I can't tolerate the load. So I'm less fit. So I'm actually slower. And I'm much better around that kind of 70, 71 mark. No, absolutely. I think, I mean, you can follow that up. I mean, what what advice would you give to someone so that maybe listen to this podcast or we know about the um, problems with social media and, mm. you know, beautification and everything like that. Mm. What advice would you give to someone, an athlete, who's worried about their body composition? Uh, in what way are they worried, Scott? So it could be, so, well, we'll take two, two different athletes. One is worried that they have too much body fat and one is worried they've got too much muscle. Uh, are they female or male? Um, female. Say female. Okay. Uh, the reason I ask those questions is because the answer depends. Mm -hmm. And the, the usually the key, for, again, for listeners, is the answer to any question that anyone listening has will be it depends. And and the the, the magic stuff is is answering those questions. What does it depend on? So who is that person? What event are they targeting? What aspects of fitness do they need to work on? Um, and so that question that you've asked is a very difficult one to answer because it's hypothetical and because we don't have all of the all of the answers. But again, it's where coaching and mentoring comes in really useful because then you can start to unpack that with another almost interested but slightly separate dispassionate individual who can give you the more objective advice and i think that that's a really important thing so in a sense if you'll forgive me rather than completely fudging an answer i'll take the opportunity to say it depends it depends it depends work on working out what those things are so that any listener can can get an answer for themselves i i might sound like i've dodged that so you can push me for a harder answer if you want no, I think I think you're you're completely right. It it does, but you you need more context. You to you know you wouldn't go and coach an athlete without first finding out training history and all, and all that sort of stuff. So mm. to give out generic advice, it's, you know, without without a bit more context is is totally fine. Yeah. Um. I mean, one of the things that might depend on as well is why why they are worried about it. You know, is it from a beautification point of view? Is it from a performance point of view? And those completely change the you know the action plan that might be put into place. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm gonna again. I'm gonna come back to this study. So because I think I think it's really important that we we make a concerted effort to balance some of those things that you're talking about, particularly from a kind of female uh, perspective. Um, and I realise that we're two guys talking on a podcast, uh, but 
you know, this is really interesting data that says essentially, girls, you should get stronger. And th this is completely in line with a lot of the other research that we could chat about in other podcasts in other weeks that says essentially, that's really good for female athletes in endurance sport and any sport to, to lift, get, get really, really strong. And I think, I think that that's important. And one of the things I've always said to a lot of athletes I've worked with is don't obsess about a particular body shape, that aspirational Instagram, whatever it might be, shape that you think is, is healthy. It's perfectly healthy to look a certain way and look an Instagram model type person, but be very unhealthy. What we want to do is eat the right things and do the right training for the goal we have at our stage of life. And then our body will become exactly what it's supposed to be. So it's all about that process and just doing the right things. And then whatever our body looks like at the end of the day, it's going to be the best version of itself. It's going to be the one most suited to our goals. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think that that's an important thing to, to hang on to is just try and get the process, the individual decisions right. And the outcome is, 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 a, is going to be a healthy body, um, even if it, it doesn't look quite like a spray tanned, edited, carefully shot um, one on Instagram. Actually, interestingly, I saw a thing um, the other day that said, I think is it in Denmark, maybe? Adverts have to have a watermark that says whether the models have been digitally edited. Okay, interesting. It's not relevant to Strathlon, but an interesting yeah. uh, interesting idea on that on that topic yeah um, and also i think just to say relevant to this audience because people will say well i'm not looking at instagram i'm looking at um you know some of the elite female or male athletes in the world and you know and i don't look like them well again remember that their aim is different to you mm -hmm. you know and remember that a lucy charles or a beth potter or you know who, whoever it might be a, a, an ali brownlee or whoever is is doing probably an inordinate more amount more training than someone who has a, a job and a family and stuff can 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 possibly do you know they're doing 35 40 hours they're doing it all over the world they're doing it you know in carefully controlled environments so you know don't expect yourself to necessarily look exactly like that person who's 20 years younger and trains full time for an example and and to to, to um follow that up have been doing so for you know the Brownleys since the age of 12 you know as long as they could run they've been doing orienteering with their parents and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff so um that training history compared to someone that's been in the sport for two years yeah such a such a vast difference so De definitely yeah but they are doing their process for their body and their aim and at any level at any level of the sport we should be focused on trying to do the same. And that might simply be trying to get to our first super sprint triathlon. We've never done sport before. We've got just about enough time to train three times a week on a good week, you know, and it's really just the case of managing the rest of life to be able to get to that goal. You just do the best you can with what you've got um, and the situation that you're in. Good nutrition, the right training, work with a coach to kind of bring all of those things together and the outcome will be what it'll be the performance will be the best performance that, it, that you can bring and, and, and your body will be the best version that it can be for you right now in your situation good any other follow-up points I, I had one more question um and then we could maybe round it up yeah go for it i feel like in a sense we've drifted way off the subject but i think one of the nice things is that we always said we wanted to take some of the science and then really make sure that it was very real world applied and i think it's been a really nice tangent but no bring us back or ask whatever question you've got and... yeah i'll bring you back around just as a sort of finishing finishing question mm. um we talked about the the rcp or the respiratory compensation point and the yep. lactate threshold for both males and females that was the best predictor of performance on the run can you give just a couple of tips on how they might improve you know, use using that information, how can they then go on and improve their, their run splits? Okay. Useful. And I'll direct people again to the upcoming course, because I think the answer for this is different for swimming, biking and running. My experience is that we would do slightly different work, even if we're trying to improve threshold in each of the sports. So it's the same marker. We do different work. That's a personal 
kind of theory and, and we'll come back to it in the more in-depth course for running specifically i think that there are there's a couple of different angles that we can take so one is that by working on vo2 the really hard stuff we use what might be called a pull from the top approach we're not specifically working on threshold but by increasing our vo2 a sort of secondary outcome is that our threshold will either probably go up or at least it will set us up to be able to do specific training that will then increase our threshold. So I think when we think about the timing of this higher intensity VO2 or um, you know maximum aerobic speed work that we've spoken about that's beneficial for female and male athletes, we want to make sure we're doing that. And if it's not relevant to our race pace, which for most sprint Olympic distance athletes, it won't be, we do a big chunk of that work, maybe eight to 12 weeks before an event, as a foundation for our threshold work. So that's where I think that would normally be placed. The higher the intensity, the closer you would move that type of work to the event. That sets up more classic threshold work. And that can either be, either be just, just stuff sort of really close to kind of race pace or sort of classically threshold is going to be what you can hold for 45 to 60 minutes when it comes to running. So it might be, that might be around your 10K pace. Or it might be a little bit slower than your 10k pace, but you can just keep kind of bashing out reps at that, doing multiple like 1k reps, let's say. Another thing you can do is to drop that pace slightly. So now you're slightly slower than threshold. You're not running quite that hard, but you're doing longer tempo efforts. And there is other research that shows that this is a really big determinant when it comes to Kenyan and East African running performance. They do a huge amount of running. So sort of 20 to 45 minute blocks of work multiple times through the week at this kind of higher end tempo, but not quite threshold work. And that yeah. is what we would term as a push from the bottom approach. So we're pushing the threshold up by working just underneath it for quite long periods of time. So anything that works around that kind of race pace I think is good and it's set up really well with some decent VO2 stuff before that in the training cycle. Okay, sounds great. Thank you very much. Hopefully that will that will help some people improve their um improve their performances. Hopefully this has been useful for everyone. Um thank you very much for listening. Uh we'll be back again next week for another article. Um hope to see you then. Cheers. Brilliant. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks for listening. We hope you found that podcast really useful. And if you did, then it's just a sample of the information that's available across the Elevate platform. Where we want to drive you towards is the Team Elevate community pages. If you're enrolled on any one of the courses across the Elevate platform, you can sign up. And if you do, then it's the place where individuals like you can come together to grow, share ideas, ask questions, interact with us and be the first to hear about upcoming courses and exclusive offers. So if you haven't signed up, sign up to Team Elevate now and we hope to see you there soon.